favorite little teddy bear. His name was Chester. Oh, it's like a yeah. Chester. I just we start it because this countdown is a little like intimidating. But please keep going. We edit out this first part. Okay. Tell us about Chester. Yes. So Chester died of old age. Poor Chester. He like started having (laughs) like he started having. I I had to Google this up. He was like it was like he would hop and like fall sideways. But apparently they have some hip dysplasia thing that happens when they get old. And so then I was like, you know what I've always wanted is a rabbit the size of my child. So I got a Holland Lop, which is like this big. um, Mm -hmm. And turns out they are little assholes. Yes, they are. So this Holland Lop, Mm -hmm. he was so bad. He dug, I like to say he dug holes to China. Like he dug these insane, insane holes. I had to get rid of it. I was like, what kind of demon are you? Like you were mean. (laughs) You dug holes. Like you dig holes like a badger oh i mean it's God. like i came out and it's like what even is going on right now you were too big for the cage so you're free ranging and then so i would take him so we had a little side business of a corn maze this is my husband's idea a couple of years ago we had a corn maze so we took our took our family petting zoo over there to the corn maze since we had this rabbit there and there's a guy who's like oh my gosh i have some of these and i was like did you want another one so after the corn maze was over i left this i left this rabbit at this guy's house and we were at dinner with his neighbor, not really like they just like lived the acreages kind of close to each other. He's like, Oh yeah, your rabbit still digs out of the cage. Yeah, he definitely does not stay in the cage. He was in my yard the other day. Like and they live acres apart, but I don't know whatever happened to that rabbit, but he I'd like a rabbit this side. I was like Well, wouldn't rabbits. it be funny to like have your kid that would like drag around this cuddly rabbit? But he wasn't cuddly, he was like a jerk. I was like, You are like a French person. <laughs> like you're a rude, per- you know, you're a French. That's what it is, right? A giant lop is a French lop, I think. Yeah, I was I, like, you're like a French asshole. Oh my God. That's so. Yeah, my, that's my rabbits are the size of children. My my Parker is seven pounds. He is an oh. infant, and then the other one, Theo, is six pounds. He's also oh an yeah. Infant. What kind are they? <laughs> Theo's a mini Rex. Are they Flemish He's- giants? No, oh. no, they're just they're they're mixed. They're mixes of things. So I don't know. I, I swear Parker is the child of like a normal rabbit and a jackrabbit. Like that's just how he looks. <laughs> like he's, I don't know. And, but they're, they're not assholes, but they're very funny where like they know they're so smart. They're always trying to get into our office. So they'll wait outside the door for us. And there's my Lanai door and the door to our apartment are catty corner to each other so if we have one open they'll run out and wait for us to open the other door it's like they're they're ridiculous how smart they are <laughs> it's funny what they can now yeah i mean people usually have these conversations about dogs and i'm like yeah i'm not i don't care that much but would you like to talk about rabbits <laughs> <laughs> it's more my jam krista anytime you want to talk about rabbits you call me up i'm happy bunny mama chats are my right, favorite it's good. <laughs> good i don't know too many people know. with rabbits I am really excited that we just were able to have such content. That, me too. Exhausted content about rabbits. <laughs> we went from rabbits yeah, exactly. to corn mazes. <laughs> me I'm not sure you even this. need. I'm not sure we even need to talk about eczema. Oh, <laughs> yeah, Enjoy your day. <laughs> See you later. Yeah. Thanks for coming. <laughs> <laughs> um. um I do not have anything going on after this to either of you, just to be mindful of anybody's hard stops. I have nothing. I have a I hard don't. Stop, I just need to touch base with my client. Great. Yeah. Great. So I think we're good. Okay, um, perfect. Boom, 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 boom. What else? I was going to say something. Anyway, Krista, are you drinking anything fun yes. over there? Mm, I had I had some orange juice and some wild berry aloe juice, and now I'm just stuck with water because I was in a hurry to get here. So Ooh, wild no, berry aloe. That sounds yummy. I know. It was in the store. I walked in, and it was at a good price. And I was like, I will take some of this. That will be that awesome. really So good. usually I'm a calcium freak for a lot of reasons, and yeah, I'm just drinking water. I'm actually quite disappointed by this. <laughs> choice right now i think if i look around i ran here you know from my home office on a on a but this is what i had earlier i had water i think this might be aloe or it might be bumble root and element mm. which is salty oh, yeah. this was this was an iced coffee made out of everyday dose which is 
a coffee powder with mushrooms and collagen. Oh, this Ooh. was my lunch before I came home today, which is a protein drink because I had no nice. plans. Is that um, State Farms? Not really. That, you, that brand? No, it's Orgain it because Orgain. I, I oh, went to okay. Costco. Ah, yeah, right. and then here's some strawberries that I didn't eat because, again, I ran home <laughs> over lunch break and was like, just the internet work, and I, I did <laughs> snacks and things. So, yeah, so now you saw what was in my lunchbox. It's not very good. I usually my the- game plan is to take – I usually take leftovers. <laughs> I'm thrilled. That was the I'm most dietitian by. thing I've ever seen. <laughs> that was <laughs> incredible. I feel like uh, I feel justified in my equal ridiculous MC. number of I'm seen. <laughs> yeah, I don't feel bad at all for having random leftover pomegranate juice in my fridge that one time at all. Oh my god, an egg egg. and three and <laughs> the most I random. Feel so seen thing. right now. <laughs> I know. What are you drinking, Meg? Ovacetal? I, yeah. You know what? I had my Ova. Oh, no, no. I do. I still have it in my tea. Yes. My Ovacetal and my ginseng tea we have. Mm-hmm. But today, I also made a smoothie. I have been loving this smoothie. Can I tell you? I did. What's in here now? You can. This is you can tell unsweetened me. acai puree. Oh. Um, I found like cooked beets, like pre cooked beets that I could just mm-hmm. keep in the fridge. So, Yum. I just like chop one of those up, throw that in there. Ginger, almond butter, soy milk. I think that's it. Uh, oh, protein yeah, there's protein powder in here too. Oh, it is so good. Mm-hmm. At first, I put like a date or two in there too, but it doesn't even need it. That's so good. That sounds yummy. Yeah. So that's what I'm drinking. What are you drinking, Kylie? You know what I'm drinking. <laughs> I have a. a, a list of things I think you're drinking possibly I knew it's gonna say Olipop <laughs> they Olipop. really need to sponsor us somebody needs to tell Olipop to send us a line because they need it's to not even us. hard I'm not even like going above and beyond to try to be obnoxious about it it's just genuinely what's always happening I love it so much mm. I mean That's nine delicious. grams of fiber I just can't you can't it's not that's incredible. That's it's so it's such a health food. Wow. It's, such a, it's such a health snack. I can't help myself. <laughs> the things we tell ourselves, the things we justify. I know, right? Um, Kylie, oh. you sound uh, your volume's a little low. Is there? Can you oh, turn it up just a little bit? How's that better? A little more, if you can. How's that? I think that's better. Okay, keep I going. I can also sit closer. Yeah, that might be better. Is that better? Yeah. I just feel like I'm so close to the screen. Okay. <laughs> Hello. Hi. <laughs> okay. Does that sound better? Yeah, it does. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. All right. Okay. So, Krista, do you, can you tell us who you are and what you do and just give us a little intro for our listeners who aren't familiar with your work? And then we can dive into, like, really picking your brain and getting the show on the road. I am so excited. Sure. All right. I'm here for all. Any weird question. If you have a weird question, the weirder the better. For me, I feel like I have a lot of useless eczema knowledge that we need to get out into the world. I can't wait. My my name is Krista Bigler. I am an integrative dietitian. I work on helping people overcome food sensitivities without food restriction or unnecessary food restriction um, to reduce inflammation, fatigue, and of course, food sensitivities gut issues and skin stuff. I don't want to like put forefront all over my website that I work on eczema and skin issues because all those people seem to find me without any trouble for some reason. Mm. Um, I think that's referral. So, or like mm. podcasts like this or something. Right. Um, so I've been running the less stressed life podcast since 2017, which is for health savvy women or, or health professionals that just want, I mean, that's like the whole mission, right? That everyone deserves a less stressed life without food sensitivity, mm. fatigue, and inflammation. So that's my shtick. Oh and my I talk gosh. a lot about eczema because I had eczema. Mm. Oh, I mean, I have had, have had the predisposition, you know, I don't really want to work on eczema, but uh, someone said mm. yesterday to me, your mess is your message. And I was like, that's such a beautiful <laughs> thing to say. Um, and that's yeah. not the truth for most of us. And I would, I would say that when you've had every single problem wrong, you have a like, this different type of empathy ability to pick up on weird little things, you know, it's just, it's just different. So in 2016, I had a huge, I had like 
you know, what I call, I, I act just like every other human being. I would say, oh, I have this genetic dry skin or it's just in the winter or I have this flakiness right here along my hairline that just shows up sometimes. And that was how I talked about that in high school. I remember going to a derm. I remember getting Eladel, whatever. I didn't really do any, you know, it wasn't like, like, I say it wasn't really affecting your life, but once you resolve a problem, you don't realize how much time you were like rearranging around it sometimes. Oh, totally. And so yeah. the short, I hope that I hope short version of the story is I took my kids to swimming lessons every day for five days. And there is some, probably some details, but that was like insulting. Like it was like sent me over this like edge of had a lot of stress was changing careers, young family, all this stuff. And I like woke up and my skin blew up. I had eczema all over my eye, all over my neck. Mm. It was a good time. It like hurt <laughs> terribly. Yeah. So um, it was a good time. I tried to work with a lot of different people. There's a lot of the same exact toolbox. Mm. So that was bummer. So mm. it took me about a year to clear that. I don't think it should take that long. I just could not find anyone to help me. And I just ended up having to dive into research eventually, mm. heal it on my own. It sucked. It wasn't very good. But, you know, again, like your pain is what – like I was – I tried to be grateful in the time because I knew it would be helpful later. So that's a little yeah. bit, of, mm. a little bit about me and why we're talking about this topic. Yeah, Krista, will you? I have several follow up questions, but will you explain what eczema is? Because people who have it are going to sure. know exactly what you're talking about, but people who don't and gratefully haven't had to have that experience are going to be less clear. Yeah, they will kind of know because they know they all know someone with eczema in some capacity. Ten to twenty percent of children have eczema. One to three percent of adults have eczema, and it's generally the overarching name. Sometimes we use the word atopic dermatitis, but it's the name mm. given to a group of conditions that cause the skin to become like red, itchy, inflamed. There are several types or several names we use for it: atopic dermatitis or these are some types of, of dermatitis or eczema, contact dermatitis, dyshydratic eczema, numular eczema, seborrheic dermatitis, etc. So it presents in different ways. Um, problem is all the same. It's not exactly all the same, I don't think. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, there's similar, out, like there's common denominators, but I think the way it's styled on the body tells you which way to go first. So looks like red, redness, inflamed skin. In darker skins and melanated skin, it can look actually more dark or gray. Sometimes it gets misdiagnosed in darker skin types as a side note. Um, so that's a thing, potentially. Mm -hmm. And then our toolbox is a little bit shallow for it. What else do I want to say about it? I want to say that sometimes people, like there's a few major types of skin stuff. I'm guessing, you know, with Meg being a skin expert, you guys have talked quite a bit about this. But there's psoriasis, mm -hmm. acne, eczema. Those are the main big ones, I would say. Car maybe keratosis pilaris, but am I missing any other main skin things? But then there's like a rash. Maybe or hives. rosacea. For me, maybe you're, I'm sorry, yeah, rosacea for sure. Mm -hmm. um, so, like a rash or hives, you know, can be for me similar treatment as eczema. Or, what else I want to say about this? In general, like if we agree, like unanimously, eczema usually has, well, like conventionally, integratively, it doesn't matter. We agree mm -hmm. that there's a staph overgrowth, topical staph overgrowth on the skin. Oh. Um, so that's some, that's a characteristic of eczema more so, um, to my knowledge. And so, yeah. So it's just something to consider because guess what? When you have topical staph on the skin, it's also inside your body growing to the outside. So every single time. Topical staph on the skin. Okay, that's interesting. We're going to have to circle back to that. But first... <laughs> I would love to have you explain when you were going through all of this, like your story, what did it look like when you had to do the dive into the research and actually get this healing for yourself because sort of the conventional options presented weren't, weren't cutting it. What did that look like? Because I assume this is very similar to what you end up doing with clients. Mm -hmm. Well, that was a messy year, right? Cause there was like, I didn't really want to be dealing with that. It was not what I wanted to be doing. <laughs> you know, I actually made it worse in the short term. Maybe you guys can understand this. Clients do this as well. What actually happens first. And so I didn't, I don't, I don't remember if I went to the regular doctor. I just don't recall. It was a long time ago because I know I'd been to the dermis before. I just do not remember what I did dermatology wise or regular doctor wise. At that time, if I'd gone, I'd just gotten a steroid. Duh. Like that's what you get. So, and that's why people sometimes are like, they, 
it's very dramatic when it goes from basically steroid as the treatment. And they're like, you know, this isn't steroid is essentially just suppressing inflammation. So it's just taking mm. the batteries out of the fire alarm. Mm. But then mm. when the next jump is like a biologic medication where you check your liver enzymes monthly, people are like, what? Yeah, There's Whoa. nothing in between. For people who don't know yeah, what a biologic not- is, we're talking like a, like a shot usually, right? Some kind of oral medication mm-hmm. is what you're saying, right? Well, steroid could be oral too, but I, just want to clarify what a biologic is for the, <laughs> for those yeah, who it's some kind of immune modulating drug. That's very expensive. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> it's not immune modulating drug that's extremely expensive. Yeah. <laughs> that's okay. what it is. That may All have right. some other risk factors. And that's the thing mm. with steroids as a side note, you know, that's the toolbox conventionally. It's like, here's a steroid. We do have a few other, like sometimes, sometimes, sometimes if there's an, an infection that's raging. So if you have a topical staph infection, so we know that there's overgrowth and then you scratch and then you move it to a different place and you translocate the bacteria again. So now you have eczema everywhere. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's places where it shows up in kids versus adults and all these things, but you move it around, but then it can get like, you can get opened up. And when it's like red and raging and horrible, that is an infection and that you will not heal from the inside um, alone. You must deal with that infection topically. So sometimes you will get a topical antibiotic if you're lucky. Mm. Hopefully you're lucky and you get that because you don't want to be having this raging, terrible topical staph infection. Okay. Mm. That wasn't your question. Your question was what do mm. I was just, I was going off on like what would normally happen. So if I'd gone to the doctor, I've gotten a steroid. <laughs> I do not recall what happened there. Maybe I had a steroid from the history. Like I feel like I did have something um, from the past I was using to kind of deal with it or suppress it a little bit, but it was around my eyes. So steroids, what happens mm. is you're supposed to actually, there's actually offboarding, like there's a, they're just temporarily and then come off of them. And often people are not educated about that. So sometimes they use it too much. It thins the skin. Mm. And if I have something around my eye, I have to be pretty oh. careful. Like steroids in general can cause eye issues. Like yeah. if you use it chronically for a long time. You can have, I don't, mm. is it cataracts? I think it's cataracts. Um, like mm. in small people, um, small mm. children um, can mm. get that if they use it chronically. So you're supposed to use, I think steroids for, I can't remember what the recommendations are from the physician's uh, association, but I think it's like two weeks and then come off. So people yeah. say well, like, oh, it was fine on steroids. And it came off and it, I mean, when people come to me, they know they're like, oh, the steroids are suppressing this. So of course it wouldn't mm-hmm. work. So I probably, I actually, now that I'm talking about it, I think I already had some of that on hand for like some of my neck, but I, I can tell you also that I knew that that wasn't a treatment, like a viable, great treatment option. That was just a band aid because mm-hmm. I had used steroids very sparingly in high school. I must've had it in my neck and I had thin skin to the point where I would give myself, so I don't really, like, I don't massively use essential oils, but you know, when you get like that sinus thing once a year, sometimes Mm -hmm. back in the day, I would put some essential oils on if I wasn't super, super careful. And of course you dilute them anyway, but I would always burn that skin because it was thin from steroid, like very infrequent Mm -hmm. steroid use in high school. Anyway, not that you care about all that. What I ended up doing was I was going to a variety of healers, integrative people, whoever trying different things. And I was getting kind of a standard ish toolbox. I felt, um, the standard toolbox can look like an omega three, maybe a probiotic. I can, Mm. I don't know, you know, you kind of just recognize it when you see it. I was doing a lot of different things. I, I mean, I, I just, you try everything in desperation. I was very familiar with like energy, medicine, muscle testing, all those things. And like, uh, they were actually giving me similar answers that chlorine was a problem that I sluggish liver and all these things. So all kinds of crap, um, (laughs) not amazing results. One thing I did do during that healing time was I took one self day. Um, I took a self care day every month for a while. Like I went and got a massage and did all types of things like just did crap like that because if I, I live like two hours from a city. And so it would be like a day thing to do that. Um, mm-hmm. I knew at that time there was like stress is usually always a <clears throat> factor with stuff. And then yeah. the next question is like, oh, how did you heal it? Oh, the other thing I did was I was like kind of learning about as a dietitian, I was learning about food sensitivities. This is really full circle for me. Mm-hmm. I was learning about food sensitivities. And what do you do when you learn about something? You're like very excited to do this test. because you think the yeah. test is going to be the answer. Mm-hmm. Tests are not exactly the answer. If you don't understand the rest of your physiology there, none of them are perfect. So I did this food sensitivity test and I restricted the foods and then I added them back and I was a disaster. Like I had oh. sensitivities I'd never had before. 
I was like, mm. I never reacted. Like I was putting pecans in my mouth and my eye was swelling at that moment. I was oh like, I've my never God. seen this before. Oh my so God. then I was in serious trouble. <laughs> um, oh. But clients do this stuff too. Like you don't know that's going to happen until it happens. Um, no. Yeah. And then you're told that it's going to be the end all be all. And this is going to be helpful. And mm-hmm. of course they want to do that to feel better. And it. Mm-hmm. Oh, right, yeah, right, right, right. It's a sad thing. And that's like literally like the entire piece of my practice now it's like can we actually not restrict your diet at all and get mm. all the same like I, I try to almost never restrict diet or, or modify I would say restriction and modify temporarily I try not to do that like there's different you know there's not a one size fits all necessarily for everyone my whole thing is like can we actually not restrict things because I see people who've already done that and they're like this is actually sucking the fun out of my life and I'm like me too. I also like birthday cake. Yeah. So um, my goal is like, can I just correct this stuff without restricting them? But anyway, back to the story from back then. <laughs> um, that's what was happening. I was like, this is a disaster. I knew that there was a gut implication. You know, I was ignoring, you ignore whispers in your body and then your body screams at you, you know? Yeah. So like mm-hmm. as a mm-hmm. child, I didn't have perfect bowel movements. I mean, I'm sure it was intermittent. You don't even pay attention unless you pay attention, you know? Mm-hmm. Because you can, it's fine. Mm-hmm. So I dug into the, the gut literature um, that I could collect from mentors at the time and also PubMed. And I was seeing a lot of like overlap on different ingredients that were supportive to gut, short chain fatty acids, etc. Now I call mm-hmm. short chain fatty acids kind of the long way around a little bit, but um, I sometimes use those and I sometimes don't in practice. But anyway, that was definitely a common denominator I was seeing like show up that I'd never really heard people talk about. So I just put myself on a bunch of supportive things and it took two months to stop reacting so severely to food. Um, Severely maybe is an overstatement because people are all over the place with things, but just Mm. very uncomfortable. Like I had to be very careful with what I was doing. Like it was significantly affecting my life. Like I cannot eat that or drink that alcohol right now, like, or any of that stuff. Like I must not touch that right now. Um, So at two months I was like hit a breakthrough where I was like, okay, I was not reacting to things. Mm. I was tolerating grass fed butter and cheese before regular dairy, all of those things. So mm-hmm. that's kind of what that looked like. I would I'd say like, it's a, it was a long road because I didn't, I couldn't find anyone to help me. I was trying, but no one knew what they were doing. Yeah. So, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. Maybe I could have found someone now, but you know, you guys know, Meg knows mm-hmm. for sure. Like there's not very many people that work on eczema. No, there's so, definitely not. There's also, it is, I know, mean, it's, now... kind of, it's kind of uncommon. Yeah. Now there's more now, obviously, but there's not a lot of people that work on skin specific skin issues in general either. Like I know there's, there's other conditions that also are lacking practitioners, but I think skin stuff, maybe it's just first on my mind, obviously in your mind, because that's what we're talking about. But (laughs) Um, so I have a question I love that you, you asked, Mm -hmm. Like the, your question is, can we <coughs> make you, can we make this better? Can we improve this without restricting the diet? So can we, like, I, I'm dying to know, is it possible? Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I actually try not to ever restrict diets. Um, so a lot of times people come in, they've already got their own restrictions, right? Mm-hmm. And so we're looking to expand everything for the most part. Yeah. And then we can talk briefly about like gluten and dairy. You know, the reason that a lot of people re- react to those is because they've got gut issues. And in general, the quality and the types of things that we intake on those are like every single day. Like if you had broccoli mm-hmm. every single day and you had a gut mess, you might have a broccoli problem. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But usually it's gluten and dairy. I mean, we also know that dairy can like it does create some mucus. It does cause some issues. You know, gluten does have some potential issues in the gut. Um, but it's really rare at the moment. Like, I guess if they're anti gliadin IgA on their stool test is really raging high, which that's a whole thing because there's the sensitivity at the lab was turned way up for the last six to seven months. So everything was like blown. I was like, I've never seen these anti gliadin IgAs this high unless you have like MS. So, um, (laughs) they just, I think fixed it like the last week or two. I don't know if you guys have feelings about this, but I do. And Mm -hmm. so, um, but your question is, can you heal things without restricting food? Yes. Sometimes I had like a kiddo though. I don't really care for 12 year old kids or like those, sorry, I don't care for 12 year old kids. I like clients <laughs> under five. I like clients under five. 
Me neither. Yeah. Just, uh... <laughs> yeah. And I have children. No, I'm just joking. What I'm saying is when you're under five, you listen to your parents and you don't really ask questions. Yes. When you're older right. than that, you're kind of a pain in the butt. You know what I mean? <laughs> Honestly, we all know until you're like 21, you're kind of a pain in the butt, right? Uh-huh. Like, yeah, may or, I may or may not fulfill. I'm like, still I have, a pain like, in the butt. I do not exclude yeah. myself from this group of people. <laughs> I have a couple. I have a couple 12 between eight and 14 year old clients right now. And it's always like, are they going to do this? Are they not going to, you know, it's like, there's a lot of like positive psychology I suggest for parents. Like we're not trying to give anyone a complex. We're not trying to restrict their diet. I had this little girl and her mom's like, Oh my gosh, she flared. And I like, look at what she's eating. And she had like an entire bag of like candy the day before and some other stuff. It's like, well, when you feed the gut bacteria, massively like you will have a flare a couple of days later <laughs> not to i don't want to demonize the peachos that she ate like the whole bag but um <laughs> just so you know so like most of my diet or most of my clients have like a high quality diet i would say also mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so i just think yeah like first high quality second like lots of good nutrients third must digest them and that's the main thing people are having sensitivities like histamine pops up all the time with eczema and it's be- histamine to me is not a food issue it is a food issue temporarily it's an ends it's a gut and liver issue you have imbalances that impede the ability for the enzymes that break down histamine dao and hnmt to work and then your liver is a bit sluggish and mature can't do its job whatever and can't move out the histamine it's just like estrogen right like mm. same stuff it can't be broken down or eliminated properly <clears> because <throat> things are not working. So. Mm. Okay. So, so that's a short answer all to of the, question. <laughs> all of the food sensitivity pieces to anything really is not at the core, at the deepest level, actually a food issue. It's like these foods get pulled into a deeper, bigger, more complicated problem. And then sometimes need to be addressed in order to like pull back the layers. Right. But ultimately not going mm-hmm. to get you where you need to go because the, the fuel to that fire is still burning on, underneath all of it, right? Yeah. And I would say like mold is the worst. Um, I'm having a moment right now where one, I had mold exposure this last year and I'm just like, whatever, it's fine. Mm-hmm. We'll be fine. I'm like, I, I knew these symptoms were not okay. And I was like, oh, this is back this, I haven't had this since uh, years no. ago when I was dealing with eczema stuff. Uh, it's fine. It's totally fine. But I have so many, like you go looking for <laughs> clients because you're just like a crazy person and you're like, this symptom is not acceptable. Like you should not be having that still or whatever. And you kind of put them all together and you're like, you know, it's a little bit fungal, like recurrent fungal. And I don't want like heavy duty. I'm unstable. And in the hospital, mold people, MCAS, I want people like me that are like, well, this is kind of annoying and it's causing, you know, some symptoms. And so anyway, the point I want to say about mold exposure, and I just don't think we're going to get away from this. I think awareness is our best friend here. So you can Mm. try to avoid and correct. Um, But if you're having some fungal or mold symptoms, you're going to have major food sensitivity issues because Mm. it's going to be oxalates. (laughs) It's going to be histamines and it's going to be all grains and coffee and chocolate, you know? Yeah. Which those, some of those overlap anyway, but I see when people go on AIP and they feel good, I'm like, well, your gut's not working, duh, right. you know, or do you yeah. have potentially some mold issues? Because if you already have mold inside of you and then you eat moldy grains, which, you know, the thing is like, you can have a capat, like you can work with a little bit, you know, if your whole foundation in your body is not like affected, but if you've had an environmental exposure and it's like taking up residence in your body, your bucket becomes full and then you can't really handle the food-based source. Mm-hmm. So I would say that's the thing. It's like, sometimes you have to empty the bucket a little bit. So you're not raging. Mm-hmm. And so some people like with histamine stuff, I just look at their journal and like, you know, you could just like sub out this spinach with kale potentially, or sub out these strawberries with blueberries or peaches, you know, and you won't really notice the difference too much, but you won't be like eating a histamine platter all the time mm-hmm. and like right. loading up the bucket on stuff that's going to make your skin flare. So, so let's, cause I, th- I think that was probably a lot for people who are not familiar with eczema to digest. So I want to just break it down a little bit in the sense that uh, backing up just a little bit about um, like we talked briefly about the more conventional treatments for eczema and kind of like what it is exactly the pathology of it and all of that. But that's not really the frame, the scope of frame or whatever, the scope of that we talk about these kinds of things on this podcast. So Mm -hmm. as far as the more functional things or the, the things outside of the typical norm, 
triggers for the skin if you have eczema so far we've talked about food sensitivities you mentioned oxalates you must mention histamines and it sounds like that just depends on the person and their exposures but you also talked about mold as a really common one so in your practice from what you see are there other things that are kind of lesser known that people should be aware of if they're suffering with eczema, just that might be triggers. And I know this is very general and probably hard to answer. So broadly, <laughs> you, could, you know, if there's anything else that comes to mind. Yeah, and broadly, help, sorry, broadly. So first of all, if you have eczema, don't worry about oxalates. If you have like pain in your hand and it feels like sharp, something is sharp and pokey or you have lichen sclerosis or vulva pain, vulva pain, maybe then care about it. Okay. Uh, and really I say, don't care about it. Care about mold. <laughs> it's not going to fix mm. your problem. Um, anyway, but for eczema, um, top eight allergens are something to just be aware of at first. Uh, I actually like anytime someone shows an allergy to eggs, I feel like very kind. It's very easy to, I don't know. We usually do fine with all that stuff in practice, but anyway, top eight allergens, which is going to be what we dairy, eggs, all the things, nuts. <laughs> There's fish. several of them. Top eight. Yeah. Fish top eight and histamines are going to be the main things that are going to struggle for eczema, but I subtype eczema in my own way. So that may be helpful if your eczema is like bright and red and spotted. Those it may respond a little bit. I really worry about this. though, giving this conversation, because what I want to say, the caveat I want to say is that if you should not just like be restricting your food for a long time, like more than three weeks is too long. That's my suggestion. Like do it all at once. Don't be switching stuff around. I have a cookbook about this. I do not make any money off of this, but it was a top eight and lowest mean cookbook to say like, do this for two weeks all at once and then move on with your life. If it does not improve, if your skin is like more dry and flaky, I think you need more liver support. And if your hands are inflamed, you were all stressed out. That's what happened there. And you have to do all the things, gut, liver, and, and stress. Um, I think COVID in, increased hand eczema. And I think there's two piece, pieces to that stress. Um, you dump a lot of nutrients under stress. And those are all, like every single case. It's like, oh, first I had eczema like this. And then I grew out of it. And then it came back. And then I had hand eczema. It's like, oh, it was stress. And they're like, yeah, it was. How did you know? I'm like, because it's always stress with hands. But with COVID, you used a ton of hand sanitizer also. And you stripped away. Yeah the phospholipid membrane on the skin, which was antimicrobial. Like it was your body's own natural shield for not letting overgrowth or like imbalances of bacteria and fungus and whatever take up residence on the skin. So you like, you know, killed all that all the time. And then it's like, here, this opportunistic bacteria is like, let me let myself in your dry skin here. And now <laughs> I'm going to take up residence and cause some problems. Let me just well, march hello. right in there. Bad bacteria. Yeah. Well, crazy. hello. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I noticed, I didn't notice no one was here. So I took it up for residence. <laughs> My name is Staphylococcus aureus. So How are you? <laughs> <laughs> Staphylococcus aureus Thanks in the me. house. <laughs> exactly. So fun. Never had that kind of conversation before on a podcast. And I like it. It's a good one. Yeah, oh, you're welcome. Well, for that. <laughs> I like that this is the march that staff does. <laughs> For those of you who can't it's like the see cha -cha. Us, if you can't see us and you're listening to us on Spotify or something, please watch us on YouTube because you have to see this march. It's it's I highly recommend. <laughs> <laughs> Not that good. It's just like a roboto cha cha. <laughs> it's a it's a great thirty that. seconds of entertainment. If you're having a rough day, come watch Krista do the eggs of a <laughs> The eggs in the dance. <laughs> oh funny good stuff good stuff <laughs> okay so we were talking about uh, you took us through what you typically see and what things you typically kind of target based on what the skin looks like and we talked about some of the common things in the environment or food or you know just in general that could be major triggers for eczema um kylie did you have another question i thought you had um some. No, go ahead. Keep keep going because I feel like you're going to get to it. Okay, so I it might I might be jumping the gun a little bit, but I'm just kind of dying to know about. I'm sure that there are a lot of people listening, and they're probably like, "Oh my god! Like, what do I even do? I have eczema. I'm I'm so confused. I don't know." And of course, our answer would be 
work with Krista or like find a find a specialist who can actually help you right like that's the <laughs> that's the end goal but we all know that's not always where people are at in the moment so can you take us through some things in general and they can be very basic if you think that they'll really help but anyone who's having issues with their skin specifically eczema are there any baseline things that people can just make sure they're doing first before they decide if mm -hmm. they need help or not yeah for sure because people always come like i've done everything and it's like sounds like you changed your laundry detergent and your toothpaste <laughs> And that might have been it, but no, people usually, <laughs> people usually go through environmental toxicants first. They usually work on their environmental toxicants first. They may or may not take a probiotic. I don't really care if they do that. What I actually think you should do is we tend to think we know more about what's going on than we do, or we, ha we haven't really, we're not very good at like putting together the pieces on our own all the time. And so what I think you should do is a bullet point history of what you have going on. I think you should Google multiple symptom questionnaire and fill it out because you don't realize what else, like you're like, oh, this thing on my skin or my face. And I call like eczema, like, it's like the weight, it's like weight, you know, it's like visible. So people hate it. It's like the thing that pushes you over the edge. You can have constipation for your entire life. No one saw it. So it wasn't a problem. Nope. You weren't covering it right. up with your clothing. So the eczema That's pushes you over the edge, point. but maybe you don't even realize that not pooping all the time was actually part of the problem because your skin is an elimination mechanism mm -hmm. as well as pooping. And urinating Amen. and sweating. So therefore, if you're not eliminating, where is that crap going to go? Pun intended, you know? So, literally, um, yes. <laughs> what, Absolutely. Yeah, literally. So Google multiple symptom questionnaire. There's a nice PDF that'll pop up. It'll auto-calculate it for you. You don't even have to do math. And just well, start filling it in very honestly. Oh yeah, there's one from that. Mark Hyman or something like that. It'll pop oh, up right away. Great. Um, okay. And so you can fill that in. It's like going to rate have you rate your symptoms in every system. And you're going to see what else you've got going on. And that's going to help you realize like, oh, maybe I do have some other things going on that also need to be improved. Because that's what I'm looking for when I talk to someone is like, what could all be fixed? Because I don't want to yeah. just fix eczema. I want to fix everything else as well. Otherwise, boring, right? Like, I don't have this like so dull to just fix eczema. It's like you have to be able to focus <laughs> on some other things also. What well, I think to is... be able to, because some things are going to heal faster than skin. Right. That's, I was actually, that happens in my practice a lot too, that I tell people as well. But one thing that I love about skin issues, and it goes back to what you were just saying, is that like, it's rarely, and you can correct me if you feel differently, but I think we're probably on the same page that skin issues are the, they're the symptom and, and conventional medicine often mm -hmm. treats them as a condition in and of themselves. Like it's just an end point. It's like, oh, you have mm -hmm. eczema. No asking why it's just, oh, it's there. But what you're saying is eczema is a result of something else. It's a result of gut issues. It's a result of uh, auto, maybe autoimmune, maybe, I don't know. Sluggish detoxification, yeah, stress. So, yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So it's a result of those things. So I think that would be really helpful if you take nothing away from else away from this podcast but just to remember that your skin mm. issue is a result of something else so i, I really love your suggestion to google the mul the symptom questionnaire so they can start making connections because that's the hard part mm -hmm. that's a great right idea. it is it's like you have to really the first step in everything for me <laughs> this is my custom process it's like awareness you may do that through testing. People want to jump straight to like fancy stuff that they don't have to do on their own. They want to go to testing. Actually, what you should do is start with a bullet point of your history. When did this start? And just kind of start writing it out and then do the multiple symptom questionnaire, start to like make associations, start to learn about this. Yes, you can work on your toxic burden and start reducing that. Great idea. And then for me, it's like, then the next step is the work. And so there's like, you know, the awareness of the testing, whatever. And then it's the work. It's like, we've got to do stuff about it. Interventions, yeah. how long it's going to take, whatever. And in the end, last piece, I think that I would like is empowerment. Mm -hmm. Did you catch the, did you catch the acronym? It's awe. It's like, you should be oh! in awe of yourself. Oh. It's like, it, I want you to know how your body works. So you're not just asking me, like, if something's okay for the rest of your life, you should know by the time you're done, how things should work, right? Like I'm trying to teach you methodology, timelines, framework based on what you're doing and what you can expect. And then we worry if you're not following the timelines, like if the timelines aren't working for you, we adjust. Right. So I it's think the maintenance piece, 
Yeah. Right? I mean, there's, there is maintenance sometimes. Yes, for sure. But like, my point is, is like, I want you to feel empowered once, like, I always think you're in such duress when you're dealing with it. And it's like, it's so cool when you get to the other side and you see results because experience is the best teacher. And so it's like, when you experience the results, everything will be fine. <laughs> like you will, like the questions will all dissipate. You'll be like, I get it. You know, I get it how it all works now, you know, cause I've lived it. Yeah. And it's important for the longevity of all of the work that you spend doing things, trying things, shooting in the dark, actually working with somebody. If you get through all of that and don't know how to continue to keep that success on your own, like what have we really done here? We've like held your hand mm -hmm. and given you no support or empowerment to be able to just get on with your life. Like, isn't the goal to put ourselves out of business? Really? <laughs> we don't want you to need us. I want to teach you so that you know how to do this. Right. I think that's what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I, I look around and everyone needs help. So I doubt we'll be out of business, but um, <laughs> I definitely don't worry about that whatsoever. But it's a matter of like your awareness is the first, if you don't have any awareness, like no one's going to convince you you have a problem. You don't think you have either. So I just think like sure. cultivating awareness is you're going to be your best friend and it's going to help you when you're in the midst of the work propel forward. And it's also going to help you not slide backwards because your awareness. So like me recognizing little annoying symptoms, like, yeah, I got a mold exposure here. Dang it. You know, mm. like I know what this is. So that is like being kind of extra aware, not crazy, but just like, yeah, you're not have to have, you're not supposed to have sores around the edge of your nose. It's not normal. You're not supposed to have that, <laughs> you know, like I know that that's a problem. So anyway, or more throat clearing that was not there before. Like, I know that's not normal. So, you know, it's awareness, but some of the fun of our work is like helping put that together with someone, right. And watching them yeah. really thrive with that information. So definitely. You see a lot of your eczema patients have an issue with mold. Would you say like most or some? I'm just having a like, moment with mold. I'm just having a moment with mold. Don't mind me. You know, <laughs> if you have like major food sensitivities and allergies, I think it can be there. I think it, sometimes everyone has gotten lucky because mold is just an aggressive fungus. So sometimes when you're treating fungus because of symptoms, you're kind of accidentally taking care of it, at least surface level, mm -hmm. but it can come back. Mm -hmm. And so all of my clients, I can, all of my clients benefit from gut work. Bingo. And many benefit from liver work and many benefit from working on stress and adrenals and all the things. And mold is just, it's just more of an aggressive fungus. So it just fits under the neat umbrella of gut work. I'm just kind of always listening for like, does this nuance this way? Are you extra sensitive? Like, does it feel like it's going this way? Cause it's just kind of a not, it's an obnoxious burden that isn't going to go anywhere. So I'm just having a moment with mold. I was having a moment with <laughs> sluggish thyroid. <laughs> um, where I'm like, you know, these just like create relapse issues. So just having a moment with, with like, everyone has this problem right now, but it's probably, I'm just being dramatic. So, and I don't mean like, you know, you really shouldn't go, go don't, don't go Google that because you don't make your life feel like it's ending. Um, it's not. So like, okay. I'm like, so I just got mold test results back. I did a split test. Go ahead. Oh no, I want to go ahead. I, I want to hear a leg. About the split test. You want to hear about the split mm -hmm. test? Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. I um, left these under my bed for many months because I'm lazy, but I did urinary mycotoxin tests in the same, out of the same cup of urine. So literally the same sample and they were totally different. So whatever. Oh. Um, they're both positive. So I think that's the real thing. It's like, they're both positive. You kind of just want to know. So here's what my belief is not testing for mold. It's too much work to do anything with it if you don't have proof of it. And mm -hmm. so I feel like for the stamina of working on it for a handful of months, you should know if it's positive. But sometimes like I had a gal, I have a dietetic intern right now and she's the sweetest pie and she definitely has <laughs> serious mold stuff. And we can tell because like when I like my mycotoxin tests provoked, that means I like the mycotoxins to come out of the deep cells that could be like this very historical exposure from childhood or years ago or whatever. Your body oh, shoves boy. it away into fat tissue. So mm -hmm. I like to provoke them all. I don't care about the, um, what the test directions say. I like them provoked. <laughs> I like them to take glutathione or do some sweating or whatever before their test. And if clients struggle to take glutathione, 
they got problems, right? They got some mm-hmm. issues in there. And so she had like, she felt very poorly when she started to take glutathione to try to provoke it. So I was like, no problem. Just go ahead and take the test, like provoked enough. And the test results were not awesomely significant. And it's like, <laughs> stupid test oh. results. Um, I'm like, it's still positive. Look at your symptoms. It's fine. I mean, it was still positive, but it just wasn't, I think in our, I think just in general, this happens all the time in practitioners. You know, it's like a bummer to me right now is I get a lot of people coming to me from other functional medicine providers and they might be functional MDs or whoever. It doesn't matter. But unfortunately, it used to be conventional medicine fails people and now functional medicine fails people too. And it's because sometimes the test, sometimes people will treat functional medicine like they do um, regular, like conventional mm. medicine. And we're like, if it's not black and white, positive, negative, or if it's not mm. that serious. I had a turning point. I had this woman with narcolepsy. And she had just moderate mold results that were positive. And I was like, well, it's just moderate. It's not that bad. We started treating it. And it was like, boom, best sleep mm-hmm. ever, you know? Mm-hmm. And it's like, okay, we need to pay attention. So that's how, that was my turning point for mold stuff. But I've always felt that way with gut stuff. It's like, even if it's like a little bit positive, I still think it warrants, you know, attention. That attention. Me- and I think that happens a lot that people are like, oh, this isn't that bad. That isn't cool. that bad. We won't really do that much. We'll just do probiotics mm-hmm. or whatever. And it's like, Treat mm-hmm. the symptoms, guys, also. Like, treat the symptoms as much or more as the test. So. I was just going to say that reminds me of what Kylie... I love Kylie. I'm not going to... Lo- I'm just going to say this every single time I see you. But I've been <laughs> posting about it on my social media because I think it's such a great quote. One time recently, Kylie was like, treat this, treat the person, not the test or something. I, fr- I don't see it now. I'm, I'm I obsessed with... I say that all the time. I'm obsessed with the quote and I'm now I'm messing it up. But it was something to that effect. <laughs> <laughs> and it mm-hmm. reminds me yeah. a lot of that. It's, I think that's so important oh, yeah. what I, you said about that. I use that. Yeah. I think that's so important about people treating functional medicine in a similar way that they can be, uh, are treating conventional. And that's, yeah, that's so important. So Krista, mm-hmm. this eczema yeah, thing, it really comes down to the gut, huh? Mm, I would say... I mean, I think I hate to make like blanket statements unanimously without fail, but there's always staph and strep overgrowth in the gut. So, Mm -hmm. and then there's other bacteria. So I feel like, you know, when those bacteria are like dandelions in the, in the lawn and then they're giving off endotoxins or their seeds and then those, that waste product needs to go somewhere and the liver has to take it out and you're just not that good at doing it. It just shows up a lot. I just think like our world is not perfect. Um, mm. I've had to like catch myself. Like I, anyway, like, I mean, I've had like plenty of times I could have eczema where I was like, Whoa, I feel sensation around my eye where I used to have that. Like, this isn't good. Mm-hmm. And then I'm like, I got to support my detoxification. So I think gut, liver, lots of things. I think the reason people don't like working with eczema is sometimes when you start working on the gut, if you, if they are really more of like, they had really sluggish detoxification, they can actually look worse. Yeah. And that's yeah. no good. And I'm not trying to ever do that to my people. Like I definitely mm-hmm. try to avoid that. I don't like the expression. You might look, you might feel worse before you feel better. I actually don't care for that. I try to avoid that at all costs, but it does happen sometimes. Mm, sure. So mm-hmm. and I think also like just dealing with people and skin stuff. Cause like we tend to be like a little bit more drama, drama, mm-hmm. dramatic about it can be. And it's sometimes so, it's, yeah, 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 <laughs> no, for sure. Yeah. It's definitely affecting our appearance. So we want it to be better. Like a year ago or a few weeks ago. And it's like, well, it's still going to take a handful of weeks from here. Sorry. Yeah. You know? Mm -hmm. So I don't know. Or maybe people just don't know how to treat it. I just like, I'm always trying to guess like, why don't people, why can't more people work on this? (laughs) (laughs) I don't know. And maybe they do. And I just don't know it. Right. And maybe Mm -hmm. I just get the leftovers. I have no idea. So (laughs) it's okay for you, huh? Right. Do you have any favorite ways that you have your clients support their detox and support their gut? And again, I know it's all very individualized, but if you were to give a few examples of things that you really love recommending for your clients, are there, is there anything specific that comes to mind? I think it depends. But what I would say is I like to educate. So I like to look up people like is, (laughs) some people ask me these like very definitive questions. They're like, is my MTHFR the reason I have eczema <laughs> in our group office hours? I was like, excuse no, me, ma'am. let me, let me pull up a picture of how the liver works. And I would like to show you that there's three phases of detoxification and you must have 
the, the phase three open first, and then we look at phase two and those nutrients there. And then we look at phase one. And if you turn up the hose and the hose is kinked, you know, phase three is blocked. It's going to be, be bad. And methylation, look at where he is. He's one conveyor belt on phase two out of like three phases. So he's one sixth of one third of the whole process. So uh -huh. yes, can be important. But also look at all of this. So if you just like look up that image, you'll see that B vitamins are important and glutathione as a master antioxidant and silymarin can be nice. And amino acids are key, absolutely key for everything. And mm. by the way, can you poop? Are you hydrating properly? Have you been sweating? I love infrared sauna. If you, you know, not the question, not the answer you were probably thinking. Love infrared sauna. It's a great way to get garbage out of the body. I actually cleared my skin 85 and 80% and it was still like rough and I could feel it. And people were like, Oh, it looks great. And I'm like, yeah, it's, it's rough actually. So, um, and the, I got it the rest of the way from infrared sauna actually. So, oh, um, wow. detoxific I love, I love infrared sauna uh, from a detoxification standpoint. And I love doing things exogenously or outside body versus just taking supplements. And yeah. what I usually do with detoxification stuff is there's not a one size fits all. So I just pick something and then rotate after I'm done and see what works well. Choline, super awesome. underrated, I would say. Yeah. I was love that, that. Was that the fully the question? I hope I got yeah. it. Yeah. Or did yeah. you ask me about products for other things too? No, I actually, exactly what I was looking for was I also am a fan more so of the exogenous thing. So I was more looking for like lifestyle things, the sauna, the sweating, the bowel movements. Like that's kind of, that's perfect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Make sure that's good first. And that's something people can do on their own without really messing it up. I don't think so. Um, how long, and I know this is the answer to this is going to be, well, it depends, but if you could pick like a general frame of time, how long does it normally take people to be able to heal from their eczema? Just to give people a little, I don't know, hope, validation, mm -hmm. hug. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So once I start a gut protocol, I want to see symptom turnaround within two to four weeks post full, um, dose. That's my timeline. It may not be, I want to see like a decrease in itching, maybe better sleep, maybe other, this is why I want all the symptoms because some of them improve faster than others and it should, mm -hmm. should be moving in the right direction. Will your skin be clear hundred percent? No, not in two yeah. weeks. Sometimes it depends on if I did modify the diet more. Some people it's like too overwhelming. Like I need to mat, meet someone where they are definitely. And again, I'm not trying to, if they're already like restricting other things, I'm going to leave things right where they are. I may not modify anything. I'm going to, again, try to not modify anything and see if I can just get it done without any modifications because our diet is probably already healthy. And you know what? People really like this. They're like, yeah, thank you. I thought you would want me to go kill my own rabbit you know no I actually don't <laughs> oh my god <laughs> sorry my heart sorry. Just fell out of my butt <laughs> oh 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 i'm dying <laughs> i thought you were gonna make me make gelatin go sorry anyway um so so um where were we <laughs> sorry <laughs> that was a bit of a distraction or a tangent there i did not mean for it to, to happen oh two to four weeks Two to four weeks after um, we get on gut protocol stuff. Sometimes if there's like all these symptoms of my liver sucks before that, I try to start that earlier because if your liver sucks, it's going to take a little bit longer. If it's like just bright red splotchy, splotchy eczema, it's like, we'll be fine. We can get over this relatively soon. Sometimes you hit a hiccup, right? Like, but within a couple of months, like I'd say the whole process is usually like two to four ish months on like, mm. I would say, I also believe that this is like, lightning fast just to be clear like it's very quick you know I'm I, I think yeah two to four um, months that's way faster than I was thinking you were gonna say me too mm -hmm. yeah I think that's normal I think if you're working like you may have to work on the other maintaining pieces much longer um mm -hmm. if you're dealing with mold stuff it's a minimum of a four month situation um overall but again, we just kind of like layer that in and deal with it. If you're dealing with stress stuff, so you may like heal and then you may pop up a little bit because you have like a, you have a, you know, the burden gets higher for some because your life is, you went on a 4th of July vacation and all this crap happened and you mm -hmm. may go backwards a step, you know, there, it kind of depends. But right. in general, I like to get, I like to cruise. I think like four months to work with people is a really good amount of time for me personally. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Speaking of. How can people find you? How can they work for, with you? In what ways can they work with you? Well, I'd love for you to go listen to the podcast if you want. Anyway, like if you just have eczema or if you just want to hear other cool things, <laughs> please About go listen to the Less Stress Life podcast. Stressing. 
I need that. I need your podcast. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's like a lot of, it's a lot of overarching stuff and, and it's, um, I've really put a lot of like thought into it recently. Like when people ask questions, I'm like, I'm just going to go answer that on the podcast. Like we're going to have a little mini Q and a episode. Um, awesome. otherwise, so you can find me at lessstresslife.com or kristabigler.com. And so I've kind of streamlined everything. And it's like, I had a couple of different programs and they had different things and they were different lengths of time and they included different things. And guess what? All that matters is that I have a problem and I want help fixing the problem. I don't care how long it needs to be or what it needs to be included. So I just kind of merged like what worked best overall and did one thing. And it feels like, ah, so nice. So I really like that. So there's one main way. Cause I'm like, you know, I just want it to be easy. Right. Like I, anyway, it's good. So I have one main that. way that you work with us. It's called food sensitivity solutions and the particular some people are like, well, you don't really talk about eczema on here. I was like, oh, yeah, I wasn't actually trying to find all of the eczema people. But, like, <laughs> half of my clients right now have eczema. <laughs> at least, at least. You know, they're definitely, definitely there. So. What did you say that was? Food sensitivity solutions what? And the fatigue fix. That's what the name okay. of the program is. Got it. Yeah. Krista. Krista. It was so <laughs> nice. We have all known quote known each other or known of each other for years and this is the first yeah. time I've actually yeah. spoken to you not through a Facebook group and seeing your face I can't wait for the option of actually seeing you for real for real I'm like mm-hmm. hugging you for real <laughs> <laughs> oh I have some ideas about when we could do that I'll tell you about it afterwards <laughs> if you want. yes so. I do this want. is this yes. is cool because you know you just do you just do not know people very well on Facebook as well. I mean, I feel like I know Meg, like her face a little bit better because I've seen her in Facebook lives, but I've not seen you in Facebook lives. So if you know, like, if you've never really watched someone's face a whole bunch before, you don't feel like you really know them that well, right? You, you don't, you don't. And you're just like trying to get the tone of them through like responses to integrative questions that like are super bizarre and weird and can't be answered. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Well, thank you so much for coming. I'm on a voice memo kind of gal. <laughs> yeah, I, I thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Now, I I think this is really helpful. Such a helpful conversation, just to give some comfort and clarity to those that might be struggling with eczema. We gave them a place to start. We gave them a place to go if they need more help. And I'm sure. Also, I just I think it's really cool to go through the basics and remind people that with a condition as complex as eczema, there's still some very basic things that you can yes. start doing right away. And I think that's really helpful. Oh, oh totally. actually I do. I'm sorry. I know we were about to wrap up, but I have, I do have one more question that I was dying to ask. <laughs> um, can I you totally talk to do us? this kind of stuff. I'm like, wait, I forgot. No, it's very important. No. Like how I didn't do you like how I didn't even ask. I did not even wait to see if you guys were okay with it. I was just like, um, here's my question. Anyway. Not necessary. Please continue. <laughs> if if you could maybe maybe briefly, if you can, just kind of give us some specifics on what you're looking for as far as diet quality. I think that was something that I wanted to ask, and I think it's maybe kind of confusing for people. Diet quality, whole foods half, uh, at least five cups of fruits and vegetables a day, half your body weight and hydration and minerals. So that's kind of my, like, it really is that easy. <laughs> it's okay. like, it does not have to be like some kind of bonkers, like diversify the colors of your plants because of, but if you don't can't digest it, nothing really matters. And that's like, people don't, people think they can digest things, but they cannot. So I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Kylie knows that all too well. <laughs> People think they can digest it, but they can't. That was great. Mm-hmm. That's the quote. Mm-hmm. That's the quote yeah. of this one. Mm-hmm. Maybe that'll be the mm-hmm. title. No. <laughs> of the, this episode. Mm-hmm. Anyway, thank you so much, Krista. It was so nice to have you on. And thank you for sticking around for an extra couple of minutes to con clarify diet quality because I was dying to know <laughs> some specifics well it could mean so many things but that's me I'm like mm-hmm. whole foods most of the time awesome also enjoy birthday life. cake from time yeah. to time yes exactly. right. yeah. thank you so much yeah yes thank exactly you. yes all right thanks <laughs>